It's the great theme of the letter to the Ephesians that it is God's will and grand purpose for us as Christians to live together in harmony and in unity. The book of Ephesians is one of, if not the most important of the Apostle Paul's letters. For here, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, Paul shares with us the doctrine and the ideal of the church. In the very first chapter of Ephesians, there is a beautiful paragraph that lays the foundation for everything else to be said in the letter. In fact, in the original Greek, the long passage from verse 3 all the way through verse 14 is actually a single sentence. Paul goes on and on, not because he is thinking in logical progression of thought, but because gift after gift and wonder after wonder from God pass before his eyes and enter into his mind. In this marvelous hymn of praise, the apostle says in chapter 1, beginning with the first part of verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now with that salutation, notice with me the great action verbs that follow through the remainder of verse 3 and all the way through verse 8. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love, he destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and insight. I love the extravagance of the word lavish because that is exactly the nature of God's grace being extended to us. Now look with me, if you would, at verse 9. You see the God who has blessed us chosen us, destined us, freely bestowed upon us, lavished on us, that God has made known his purpose, his will, which is a plan for the fullness of time. I think I'm coming to understand that this is a very significant passage of Scripture. The God and Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who has A, B, C, D, E, has set forth his purpose, his will, his plan, which is to unite all things in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. Do you believe that? Do you really believe that? I think it's finally starting to get through to me after all of these years. Folks, God really is at work in our world. God has a plan. God has a purpose. God has a will. And his will will come to pass. Did you know that God only has to will for something to happen for it to actually occur? So you see, God has a plan, he has a purpose, he has a will, and now as verse 10 tells us, ultimately God's will is going to come to pass, and God's will is to unite, to heal, to gather up, to reconcile, and to bring together everything in heaven and on earth. At this stage in my ministry journey, I'm coming to believe that you can sum up the whole grand purpose of God in the entire universe under that magnificent term, reconciliation. God's desire is to heal, to unite, 
to bring together. Now, I'm sure you're not listening this morning to hear about all of the fragmentations and hurts and divisions that divide our world. But my dear family in Christ, there are plenty of them. And as you're sitting there viewing this, you look so pious and so religious. And as far as I know, you may have already had a big fight this morning. Are you getting ready for one after the message is concluded? But whenever we look at this world without Christ, we find that there is nothing but disunity, separation, anger, bitterness, frustration. But we know that that is not God's will or his purpose. I'm convinced that this disunity, this disharmony, this fragmentation can only become united when all things and all people and all powers in heaven and on earth are united under the Lordship of Christ. God has appointed Jesus Christ as the instrument of reconciliation. But we, you and me, the church, as Christ's body, are the Lord's instruments of reconciliation. And we have been called to demonstrate in the life of the church this unity, healing, and reconciliation by the way in which we relate and interact with each other. The only way that this can truly happen is when we exist in transparency and vulnerability of genuine, selfless, Christ-like love. And now after these first three theological, magnificent passages, Paul turns in chapter four and he gets down to earth with us with some very practical advice. Look with me at Ephesians four and verse one. Paul writes, I therefore the prisoner in the Lord beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Now, I'm going to share with you a very simple lesson in exegesis if I may. In the Pauline epistles, whenever Paul uses the word therefore, you need to look very carefully and see what it's there for. So wherefore this therefore? We can deduce that something is getting ready to follow that is the conclusion to that lofty hymn of praise to which Paul has raised us to the heights of glory in the first three chapters of this book. So let me read it once again and this time include the second and the third verse. I therefore the prisoner of the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. I beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. May I admit to you, I don't know what to do with the word worthy. I'm not free to say that I don't like the word, but I am free to say that I don't know what to do with it because I don't know who is worthy. I can think of a few who aren't, none of whom are around us today, thank God. You know, with all of our faults, we really are the nicest people we know, aren't we? Well, I don't know what to do with this term, but I am so thankful that this is an exhortation and not a command. It's a call. It is a point to the direction in which we are to move in our Christian discipleship. 
The Apostle Paul begs us to be worthy of our calling as Christians, this awesome, marvelous calling of participating in the reconciling, healing purposes of God by humility, gentleness, patience, selfless love, with an eagerness to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We have been called by God to love each other in Jesus' name, to take responsibility for those around us and to serve their interest even beyond our own. Well-known author Peter DeVries has written, and I quote, Our business in life is not to see through one another, it's to see one another through. As disasters go, this one was terrible, but not unique in the history of U.S. air crashes. There are a couple of unusual elements associated with this particular crash. First of all, there's the bridge and the fact that the plane clipped it at the height of rush hour traffic. And then there's the location of the event. Washington, D.C., our nation's capital, turned chaotic by a blast from a real winter snowstorm. All of those factors are worth noting, to be sure, but there's still nothing really extraordinary in any of it except death, which, while always special, does not necessarily bring millions of people to tears or draw national attention for days and even for weeks following the event. So why then is this particular crash so noted and still remembered yet today? The person most responsible for the continuing emotional impact of the disaster is the one who was known at first simply as the man in the water. Balding, probably in his fifties with an extravagant mustache, he was seen clinging with five other survivors to the tail section of the airplane. This man was described by officers Usher and Windsor, the police helicopter team hovering overhead, as appearing alert and in control. Every time they lowered a lifeline and flotation ring to him, he passed it off to another of the passengers. Officer Windsor said, in a mass casualty, you'll see people like this man, but I've never seen anyone with that level of commitment. After all of the other five people clinging to the tail section had been rescued, when the helicopter came back for this man, he had slipped beneath the waves and was gone. His courageous and selfless love for humanity, for his fellow men, is why this story has held such national attention and why we remember it years afterward. The officers also reported that at some moment in the water he must have realized that he would not live if he continued to hand over the rope and the ring to others. He had to realize this, no matter how gradual the effect of the cold. When the helicopter took off with what was to be the last survivor, this man, treading water, watched everything in the world move away from him, and he deliberately let it happen. That heroic example of self-sacrifice powerfully brings to mind another such example. 2,000 years ago, the Son of God came into our world and dwelt among us. He came to pay the price for our sins, knowing that in doing so it would cost him his own life. When his betrayer ran away and the disciples fled, he watched everything in the world move away from him. 
and he deliberately let it happen. That's courageous, selfless, all giving love for others. And here today in the 21st century, it is still true that when we surrender our lives without reservation to the Lordship of Christ Jesus, the peace of God floods over our souls, enabling us to live together in humility, gentleness, patience, genuine love, and a spirit of unity as instruments of peace and agents of reconciliation. Jesus said it this way in the Gospel according to John, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. And now as we conclude this morning, receive this benediction. As you go on your way, may God go with you. May God go before you to show you the way, behind you to encourage you, above you to watch over you, beside you to befriend you, and within you to give you his peace. In your going out and in your coming in, in your rising up and in your lying down, in your labor and in your leisure, in your laughter and in your tears. Until that day when we stand before his presence that will need no light, for he himself will be our light. Go in the knowledge that he loves you and that he has called each of us to love others. God bless you.